Hi everyone. So I hope that you were able to get through the third scene for the tragedy of Macbeth. What I would like to do today before I get into the next two scenes is just to kind of go over some of the information that you have so far to make sure we're all on the same page. I'd like to review a few things from scene three and then together we'll listen to scene four and five and we'll work on some annotations. Um, so if you take a look at your screen, you have the study guide information that you can find in the lesson folder for, for Monday. Here I give you some vocabulary terms that appear in the text. One of them is the Thane uh, term, which is a member of an aristocratic class and holds land. And again, this is the new uh, title that Macbeth has been given. The word valor here means bravery. Prophetic is predicting future events as if by supernatural forces. And obviously we saw that with the witches, and we're going to talk a lot more about that when we meet Macbeth's wife, Lady Macbeth. Here I also provide some background information um, and then some literary terms that you need to become familiar with. One of the literary terms that I want us to become accustomed to using and seeing is the term aside. Aside is a remark made quietly so as to be heard by a select group of people and not by others who are nearby. In Shakespeare's play, sometimes a character makes an aside to the audience. So anytime you see that word aside in the script, it's usually in parentheses. It means whatever comes after it is only meant for you, the reader, the audience, to know about it or a particular character if the, the character is um, close to the person who is who's saying the aside. And then the second most important term here is soliloquy. We're going to work with soliloquies today. A soliloquy are lines spoken by one character on stage. These lines are not meant to be heard by anyone. Soliloquies function to communicate a character's inner thoughts and usually communicate an internal conflict. So I want you to keep in mind soliloquy starts with the letter S, so does the word single. Um, so it's one single character on stage speaking to themselves. And whatever is being said is only meant for you, the audience, to hear. Okay. So you have this, again, available to you in the lesson folder for Monday. So if you take a look at your script, you needed to read uh, scene three. I just want to bring your attention to page four of your script where you have the three witches speaking and then uh, Macbeth and Banquo enter. Here. Now the witches in the first scene said, when shall we meet again? And they use the term foul is fair and fair is foul. So here, while Macbeth and Banquo are walking, I'd like you to notice that um, Macbeth makes a point that the day is very foul and a fair day as well. So he says, so foul and fair a day I have not seen. So this is then when the witches are able to appear to both Macbeth and Banquo. So they go on, and I'm just going to jump, if you notice, now I'm on page 8 um, through the script, because Banquo and Macbeth have a conversation after the witches leave. I'm going to actually show you a quick video so that you can see uh, what happens between the witches, Macbeth and Banquo, and then I'll come back to your script. As the three witches wait for Macbeth, they discuss their recent series of mischievous acts. The witches is hand in hand, hostess of the sea of land, thus to go out to bed, first to die, first to cry, and first to end to make up mine. Peace, the child was not. So foul and fair a day I have not seen. What are these? Speak, if you can. What are you? All hail, Macbeth. Hail to thee, Thane of Glamis. All hail, Macbeth. Hail to thee, Thane of Cawdor. All hail, Macbeth. That shalt be king. Here I 
the future, the witches tell him that while his sons will be kings, he will not be one. The sudden encounter leaves Macbeth little confused, and he asks the witches to stay and explain what they mean since the Thane of Cawdor is still alive, and he can't believe that he would ever be king either. But the witches simply disappear. <laughs> Your children shall be kings. Oh, you shall be king. And <laughs> Thane of Cawdor too. Went it not so? Suddenly, Ross and Angus, two of the king's messengers, arrive and bring with them some surprising news. Macbeth has actually been given the title and land of Thane of Cawdor. Do you not hope your children shall be kings? Tis strange. In an aside, Macbeth realizes that since two of the witches' predictions have already come true, it almost seems as if the third might come true as well. But when the thought of murdering King Duncan enters into his mind, he begins to feel nervous. In fact, he wishes that he won't have to do anything at all to achieve the witch's third prediction. <sighs> come what come may, time and the hour runs through the roughest of day. Worthy Macbeth, we stay upon your leisure. <clears throat> Let us toward the king. Okay, so that kind of gave you a quick overview of the scene that you had to read. And what I want to quickly go over with you are all of these asides. The witches hail Macbeth as the theme of Glamis and of Cawdor, and he is a little confused because he says, I get the glam the Glamis, but what about Cawdor? I know that the theme of Cawdor is still alive. How could that be? And I work for the king. How could it be that I'm going to become king? So if you have your script and you're following along with me, on page 8 is where this particular conversation becomes important. Macbeth says, if chance will have me king, why chance may crown me without my stir? In other words, what Macbeth is saying here is, if fate wants me to be king, then perhaps they're going to do what needs to be done and I don't have to do anything to help myself become king. Um, then he goes on and he's talking to Banquo because the witches said that although Banquo is not going to be king, his children will. And now that kind of doesn't make sense. If, they, if the witches said Macbeth was going to be king, then that means following that, his children, his sons, will also be kings after him. But that's not what the witches are saying. The witches are saying that Macbeth will be king and Banquo's sons will be kings. So either Macbeth doesn't have children or Macbeth's children are never going to be crowned kings. So this, although here he says, if this is fate, then so be it. I'm not going to do anything to, to mingle with it. He then begins to talk about how it could be possible. Okay, so um, let me kind of bring you to this aside. Let's take a look at the modern translation so we can better understand it. Macbeth tells Banquo, I beg your pardon, I was distracted. Again, he's thinking about being king. Kind gentlemen, I won't forget the trouble you've taken for me whenever I think of this day. Let's go to the king. And so, speaking so that only Banquo can hear, Macbeth says, "Think about what happened today, and when we're both ha and when we've both had time to consider things, let's talk." So Macbeth doesn't want to talk about the um, the way that things are supposed to go if the witches' prophecies are true that Banquo's children are going to take Macbeth's throne. So that's going to bring us to scene four. Scene four has the king, King Duncan, his sons, Lennox and Malcolm, Donald then as well, and some of their attendants. And they're talking about the war that has just ended. Then we're going to move into scene five, where we finally meet Lady Macbeth. And I want us to focus on what type of a person she is. So I'm going to play the recording for us so that we can 
follow along. Is execution done on Cordor? Are not those in commission yet returned? My liege, they are not yet come back. But I have spoke with one that saw him die who did report that very frankly he confessed his treasons, implored your highness pardon, and set forth a deep repentance. Nothing in his life became him like the leaving it. He died as one that had been studied in his death to throw away the dearest thing he owed as to a careless trifle. There's no art to find the mind's construction in the face. He was a gentleman on whom I built an absolute trust. So remember that the Thane of Cawdor uh, was a traitor. He wanted to um, to uh, to overcome the uh, King Duncan's throne, and so Macbeth was one of the one of the soldiers, the brave soldiers who went in and fought and won that battle. So the king ordered the Thane of Cawdor to be killed. Malcolm says, "I heard from someone that was there that he is indeed." dead. So now that particular title is left open. And remember that the witches said that Macbeth was now the Thane of Cawdor. So as Duncan uh, is speaking with his, with his sons, Macbeth, Banquo, Ross, and Agnes enter. Oh, worthiest cousin, the sin of my ingratitude even now was heavy on me. Thou art so far before that swiftest wing of recompense is slow to overtake thee. Would thou hadst less deserved that the proportion both of thanks and payment might have been mine. Only I have left to say, more is thy due than more than all can pay. The service and the loyalty I owe in doing it pays itself. Your highness part is to receive our duties, and our duties are to your throne and state, children and servants, which do but what they should by doing everything safe toward your love and honor. Welcome hither. I have begun to plant thee, and will labor to make thee full of growing. Ah. Noble Banquo, that has no less deserved, nor must be known, and no less to have done so. Let me enfold thee and hold thee to my heart. If I grow, the harvest is your own. My plenteous joys, wanton in fullness, seek to hide themselves in drops of sorrow. <laughs> Sons, kinsmen, thames, and you whose places are the nearest, know we will establish our estate upon our eldest, Malcolm, whom we name hereafter the Prince of Cumberland. Which honor must not unaccompanied invest him only, but signs of nobleness like stars shall shine on all deservers. From hence to Inverness and bind us further to you. The rest is... So I'm just going to stop here for a minute to discuss exactly what just happened um, with King Duncan. He's very pleased with Banquo and Macbeth. He's thanking them. He uses that term cousin to refer to them, not as relatives, but as kingsmen. And he says he's so happy that um, really nothing can make him more happy. But he does want to make the announcement that his eldest son, Malcolm, is named the Prince of Cumberland. This is important. I'm going to highlight it for us. This is important because what this is basically telling everyone is that King Duncan has now officially named his eldest son, Malcolm, the heir to the throne. He has to be the, crowned the prince first before he can take over the, the throne when his father dies. So Macbeth has just heard from the witches that he's supposed to be king, and yet, at this very moment, he's learning from King Duncan that he, the king already has someone to take over the throne. So I want you to keep that in mind because this is going to stay in the back of Macbeth's mind. Let's continue. Labor which is not used for you. I'll be myself the harbinger and make joyful the hearing of my wife with your approach. So humbly take my leave. My worthy Cawdor! So now, Macbeth has been named the Thane of Cawdor. The Prince of Cumberland. That is a step on which I must 
fall down or else o'erleap, for in my way it lies. Stars, hide your fires. Let not light see my black and deep desires. The eye wink at the hand, yet let that be which the eye fears when it is done to see. So notice that this is an aside, so this is only meant for us to uh, to listen to. And uh, Macbeth kind of confesses, I'm, I'm a little bit upset. Uh, I just heard that Malcolm is going to be the, the king, and that kind of is in my way of becoming king. But I don't want anybody to see how upset this is making me. Uh, I, I need to make pretend that it's not bothering me. And so he leaves. Like he said, he's going to travel home to prepare for King Duncan to stay at Macbeth's home. So he exits, and now we're back to uh, King Duncan. True, were they, Banquo? He is full so valiant, and in his commendations I am fed. It is a banquet to me. Let's after him, whose care is gone before to bid us welcome. It is a peerless kinsman. Okay, and that's the end of scene four. They're all going, King Duncan, his children, um, and Banquo are all going to meet Macbeth at his castle. So now we're going to go into the next scene, scene five. And remember, anytime we move into a new scene, we're moving the setting. So this is in uh, Macbeth's castle. It says, enter Lady Macbeth alone with a letter. So as we read this, what, again, I want us to, to keep in mind is the objective for today. I want us to be able to characterize Lady Macbeth. What kind of a person is she? They met me in the day of success, and I have learned by the perfectest report they have more in them than mortal knowledge. When I burned in desire to question them further, they made themselves air, into which they vanished. Whilst I stood wrapped in the wonder of it, came missives from the king, who all hailed me Thane of Cawdor, by which title before these weird sisters saluted me, and referred me to the coming on of time with Hail King that shalt be. This have I thought good to deliver thee, my dearest partner of greatness, that thou mightst not lose the dues of rejoicing by being ignorant of what greatness is promised thee. Lay it to thy heart and farewell. So this is the letter that Macbeth has written his wife, and he's talking about the witches. He says they, they seem some something very supernatural, but they had a lot of knowledge, and they greeted me with these three titles. So she, he says, I just want you to know what is going to follow, what greatness is promised for us. And he calls his wife his dearest partner of greatness. So this kind of alludes to the idea that Lady Macbeth and Macbeth are equal partners in this relationship, which would not really be the case during uh, Shakespearean time. Gloms thou art, and Cawdor, and shalt be what thou art promised. Yet do I fear thy nature, it is too full of the milk of human kindness to catch the nearest way. Thou wouldst be great, but not without ambition, but without the illness should attend it. What thou wouldst highly, that wouldst thou wholly. Wouldst not play false, and yet wouldst wrongly win. Thou'dst have, great gloms, that which cries, thus thou must do, if thou have it. And that which rather thou dost fear to do, than wishest should be undone. Hie thee hither, that I may pour my spirits in thine ear, and chastise with the valor of my tongue all that impedes thee from the golden round, which fate and metaphysical aid doth seem to have thee crowned withal. What is your tidings? The king comes here tonight. Thou art mad to say it. Is not thy master with him, who, were it so, would have informed for preparation? So please you, it is true. Our thane is coming. One of my fellows had the speed of him, who, almost dead for breath, had scarcely more than would make up his message. 
give him tending. He brings great news. The raven himself is hoarse, that croaks the fatal entrance of Duncan under my battlements. So notice that she, uh, Lady Macbeth says that, um, like a raven, there is the announcement of Duncan's entrance into the castle. But it's a fatal entrance. In other words, Lady Macbeth is already plotting something to get rid of King Duncan because she assumes that her husband won't do anything to help himself become king. We'll talk a little bit more about it at the end of the of the scene. Come, you spirits that tend on mortal thoughts, unsex me here and fill me from the crown to the toe, top full of direst cruelty. Make thick my blood. Stop up the access and passage to remorse. That no compunctious visitings of nature shake my fell purpose, nor keep peace between the effect and it. Come to my woman's breasts and take my milk for gall, you murdering ministers. Wherever in your sightless substances you wait on nature's mischief, come, thick night, and pall thee in the dunnest smoke of hell, that my keen knife see not the wound it makes. Nor heaven peep through the blanket of the dark to cry, hold, hold, great gloms, worthy Cawdor, greater than both by the all hail hereafter. Thy letters have transported me beyond this ignorant present, and I feel now the future in the instant. My dearest love. Duncan comes here tonight. And when goes hence? Tomorrow. As he purposes. Oh, never shall sun that morrow see. Uh, your face, my fane, is as a book where men may read strange matters. To beguile the time, look like the time. Bear welcome in your eye. Your hand, your tongue, look like the innocent flower, but be the serpent under it. He that's coming must be provided for, and you shall put this night's great business into my dispatch, which shall to all our nights and days to come give solely sovereign sway and masterdom. We will speak further. Only look up clear. To alter favor ever is to fear. Leave all the rest to me. Okay. And that brings us to the end of scene five. So what I would like to do is to just spend a little bit of time annotating this particular soliloquy. So in the beginning of the lesson I went over the definition of a soliloquy. Remember, it's a uh, dialogue by one character alone on stage, and they express their feelings, their thoughts. So the audience, you the reader, are the only people that would be made aware of these things. So Lady Macbeth is reading the letter from her husband, and she learns that he is going to be apparently crowned king. But it's after reading the letter that we begin to see um, or learn a little bit more about her opinion of her husband. So I'm going to work with the original text, but I'll go back to the modern just to help us out as we, you know, progress throughout the, throughout the soliloquy. She goes and she says, um, Glamis thou art in corridor, and shalt be what thou art promised, yet I do fear thy nature, it is too full of the milk of human kindness to catch the nearest way. So if we take a look at the modern translation, she says, You are the thane of Glamis and Cawdor, 
and you're going to be king just like you were promised. But I worry about whether or not you have what it takes to seize the crown. You are too full of milk, of human kindness to strike aggressively at your first opportunity. She even goes on and she says that he lacks ambition. So as part of our annotation, I want us to be able to, here on the side, um, write a little bit concerning um, uh, concerning this. I'm just going to summarize. Okay. So Lady Macbeth... fears that Macbeth is too kind for you guys too kind uh, to do anything needed to obtain the crown and this is what gets her moving this is what motivates her to come up with some sort of, uh, of plan to help her, her husband. She goes and um, she continues on down here at the bottom. She says, thus, must, thus thou must do if thou have it, and that which rather thou fear to do, then wish it should be undone to highlight that as well. So if we take a look at the modern translation here, she goes and again she tells us that uh, her husband lacks ambition and the things that he wants to do, you want to do like good men. You don't want to cheat, yet you want what doesn't belong to you. There's something you want, but you're afraid to do what you need to do to get it. And that's, again, part of her uh, opinion of her husband, Macbeth. Very different from what we get in the first two scenes where everyone hails Macbeth as somebody who is, um, who is very brave. So she says, Macbeth is too afraid to do anything. And he needs someone to help him. So that's kind of the annotation that we'll put here to the side. But then notice at the bottom here as well, she goes and uh, she continues on to say, which fate and metaphysical aid doth seem to have the crowned withal. In other words, she says, I, I need to, to do something because fate and witchcraft both seem to want you to be king. Now, what I want us to note here is how ironic this is. Right? If fate has it for Macbeth to become king, why does he have uh, to make make it happen? That's the irony that we see in this last part. So we need to consistently ask ourselves this to try and figure out uh, why Lady Macbeth feels so strongly that she needs to, to intervene. So she's interrupted for a minute by the servant informing her that her husband is on his way. And again, she says that Duncan is going to meet this fatal entrance. In other words, he's going to enter that house but never leave. And then notice what she does. She goes and she says, Come, you spirits that tend on mortal thoughts, unsex me here and fill me and fill me from the crown to the toe top full of dearest cruelty. So she comes up with this plan and then it's almost as if she's conjuring some sort of spirit to help her in her plan to to uh, to do something. So it seems like Lady Macbeth, I'm just gonna use an L there for Lady. Uh, Lady Macbeth is 
I guess, conjuring spirits to help her. And this phrase, unsex me, is so important because remember that during Shakespeare's time, women didn't have um, authority. They weren't even allowed to act, so this would actually be played by a man. But for Lady Macbeth to ask these spirits to unsex her, to strip her of her uh, feminine qualities, is very powerful. So what she's in essence um, saying is that she wants to be um, as strong as strong as a man. So again, something very, very powerful during this time. In the beginning, it seemed that Lady Macbeth and Macbeth were equal partners in this relationship, but at this point, what she wants is for her to be stronger than her husband. Um, and that's very important um, in this scene. What I would like you to do is to continue to annotate her soliloquy. There are a couple of things that I want you to make note of. One of them is um, the use of literary elements when she continues to talk about what it, it is that she wants and what she tells her husband Macbeth when he comes in. Why is it that he speaks the way that he does? He goes and he says tomorrow as he purposes to reference King Duncan leaving, right? So you have this annotation in the folder for today's lesson. You're going to complete that and hand that in for Friday. Your homework is going to be to finish reading the act, which are scenes six and seven. So here, after you finish annotating, you'll get a better idea or understanding of the type of person that Lady Macbeth is.